Rapa Nui is a tiny South Pacific island with a towering presence. Officially, it's part of Chile, three and a half thousand kilometres to the east. Named Easter Island by an 18th century Dutch explorer, Rapa Nui would have been nothing more than a dot on a map, if not for its megalithic stone statues, the Moai. about a thousand moai scattered around the island and at first glance they all look pretty similar but once you get up close and personal and really take a good look you can see that each one is unique and rather than all looking austere some have other expressions like this one which well rather wistful I think. But the famous faces of Rapa Nui are in danger of becoming faceless. Lashing wind and rain and searing sun are all taking their toll. Now the race is on to preserve these centuries old sentinels so they and their secrets are not lost to eternity. These objects are very friable, they're very fragile, they're not going to last forever. And the record that we have, we can, we're certain of, um, is required in order to, to, to take care of them properly. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> can you see it? What is it? It's a fish hook. Ah. It's a fish hook made of bone. Californian archaeologist Dr. Joanne Van Tilburg has spent 30 years trying to solve some of the mysteries surrounding ancient Rapa Nui civilization. Well, we're very excited. We've been wanting one of these for a long time. <laughs> Even if it's broken, it's still <laughs> special. Christian, can you explain what you're doing? We are suffering down here. <laughs> 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 As you see, we have like Working alongside Dr. Van Tilburg is Christian Arevalo Pacarati, a Rapa Nui graphic artist. What is it being screening lately? Together, they run the Easter Island Statue Project. So, what you're finding is. It's all new. It's all completely new. It's all completely new. Over more than two decades, they've measured, mapped and documented every moai on the island. At last count, 1,045. It's so exciting. <laughs> well done. <laughs> now they're conducting the first comprehensive scientific excavation of statues inside Rano Raraku, the volcanic crater where nearly all the moai were carved. The inner rim is a place of privilege, off limits to all but a few. Nearly 400 statues remain in various stages of creation. Were they abandoned in haste? And if so, why? War? Famine? Or were some of them just not up to scratch? It's like walking into a factory where everybody's assembled cars and they say, OK, guys, this is finished. Yeah. And then you find all these cars in the line of assemble. This season's dig aims to uncover more pieces of the Rapa Nui jigsaw. And what are you hoping that will lead you to? The answer to all the mystery. <laughs> I'm interested first in, in coming to understand human behavior on this island relative to this clear obsession to produce a very large number of objects. The second thing I'm really interested in is how our work and our records can help conserve and preserve the statues. Despite their formidable appearance, the statues are delicate. 
The volcanic tuff from which most was sculpted as many as 900 years ago is crumbling, in some cases to the ground. And I've been seeing already in 27 years, our entire statue being degraded to the ground. It's melted to the ground already. It's soil now, it's not a statue anymore. Christian Pacarati has an artist's eye for detail. He sees not only the features of his ancestors in the statues, but also a carved record of their lives, their values and their activities. If you see the nostril of the statue, from any angle, you're gonna see like uh, that this nostril is actually a fish hook instead of a nostril. The Moai are an invaluable, if still inscrutable, map of the society which created them and about which so many questions remain. I just want to uh, draw as much as I can before the statues are gone. The more we archive, the better for the statues and for the Rapa Nui people. It's now largely accepted that Rapa Nui was settled by Polynesian voyagers sometime between 400 and 1200 AD. Maori sailors from New Zealand last year proved that such a daring journey was possible. In traditional double-hulled canoes, they sailed the 7,000 kilometres to Rapa Nui, using only the sea and sky to navigate. Oral tradition has it that Rapa Nui's first king, Hotu Matua, came ashore with his family here at Anakena Beach. <laughs> that small group was the nucleus for what became an extraordinary civilization. And my idea about Rapa Nui is that artists have shaped this island and its culture from its beginning in a profound way, in ways that we don't see on some other Polynesian islands. So I think the ability to articulate in an object an idea is what drives religion. In ancient Rapa Nui, religion centered on the Moai, the deified representation of a family's ancestor. The Moai watched over their clans and lands and passed on their full power or mana when fitted with coral eyes. For Vaiheri Tukiheoa, handling the tools that her forebears used to carve the statues is spine tingling. It's a dream that I have since I was a um, little child. She's part of the archaeological team working in Ranoraraku. She believes it's only in understanding their history that Rapa Nui can build a prosperous future, free of their colonial overlords in Chile. When you are in school, uh, you learn a history of Chile but you are not learning history of Hotumatua, the first king of Rapa Nui. And that is the story that the children really want to know. And that is what makes us Rapa Nui. The ancient Rapa Nui established a highly sophisticated society geared around making and moving the statues. But Moai mania, which reached its height between 1200 and 1600, came at a cost. Giant palm trees with massive trunks once covered much of the island. They provided food, shelter, fabric and wood for the Rapa Nui. Those trees no longer exist. This is one of the few pockets of palms on the island. They're not native trees. They were imported from Tahiti. By the time European explorers arrived in 1722, Rapa Nui was denuded. 
its population had shrunk from perhaps 10,000 people to a few thousand. Some scientists argue that cutting down trees to move and erect the statues was largely responsible for deforestation and ultimately the collapse of Rapa Nui's ecology and society. Dr Van Tilburg is not entirely convinced by the collapse theory. From her own experiments, she believes logs were used to move the moai, in much the same way as the seafaring Polynesians move their heavy canoes across land. But she says other factors, such as climate, may have played a key role in determining the highs and lows of Rapa Nui society. We don't know, for example, about how nature intervened here. And one of the things that we're looking at, particularly in the quarry, because of the water there, is what drought would mean on this island. It would cause serious problems. What is known is that European contact had a devastating impact on a proud and resourceful people. By the late 1800s, Peruvian slave raids and introduced disease had reduced the population to just 111. Rapa Nui had been annexed by Chile, leased to a foreign company and turned into a sheep and cattle farm its indigenous people confined to the settlement of Hungaroa. Hungaroa is still the only town on Rapa Nui, but today it's home to nearly 6,000 people. Only half have Rapa Nui roots, a growing number of residents are from mainland Chile. Then there are the tourists, 50,000 a year and rising. Es que, por ejemplo, hoy en día en Rapa Nui, y, eh, la única fuente sólida de trabajo es el turismo. Porque si no existiera el turismo, yo creo que eh, Rapa Nui tendría muchos problemas económicos. Pantu Tapano runs a successful horse riding business. The name is your horse. It's Mahanga. He takes tourists across his ancestral lands, but needs permission to do so. Most of the island's 170 square kilometres is National Park, administered by the Chilean government. And that gives it control of Rapa Nui's most precious resource, the Moai. Chile is making good deal of money because of Rapa Nui. They publish their tourism with Rapa Nui Moai with our intellectual property. The Rapa Nui Parliament is fighting to return all the land that today remains in the hands and administration of Chile to return to the Rapa Nui people, to the owner, to the inheritors. <laughs> Eriti Tiave is the human rights minister in the Rapa Nui parliament, a self-styled group comprising representatives from each clan. The parliament is suing the Chilean government for allegedly breaching its 1888 treaty with the Rapa Nui king. 
MPs say nothing short of independence will safeguard Rapa Nui's heritage. Our ancestor left behind a fortune for us. Like um, the Middle East have oil, this is our oil, our patrimony, our culture. We don't need Chile, we are 3,000 people. Vaiheri Tuki Hayoa is a strong supporter of independence. Oh, wow. It's a dream. That is a dream. Because we are losing now our language, our culture. There's many um, people from foreigners. They came here, uh, they start um, their life here, their business, and they change our cultural system. Despite a strong turnout at a recent pro-independence march, not all Rapa Nui believe going it alone would work. Many favour regional autonomy under the umbrella of Chile, but only if it delivers them control of their resources, such as the Moai. Una regionalización para mí implica el manejo autónomo de, de los recursos. Básicamente eso. Y eso creo que es uno de los más importantes que debiera existir aquí para lograr proteger la arqueología. Joan? Ya. Yeah. We have a bomb. Maybe human bomb. Rafael Rapu is a 24-year-old archaeology graduate, a trained scientist who also feels a deep emotional connection with the Moai. Para mí es muy emocionante, sobre todo cuando estoy ahí descubriendo el Moai debajo de ella, eh, quedo totalmente impactado. His discovery of a bone fragment should be a triumph, but as a Rapa Nui, he has mixed feelings about potentially digging up the remains of an ancestor. Really, I, I don't, I don't like to to take this bone mm. because maybe my my grand great great father they, he wanted to stay in here. I can't explain it. Really. Mm. Si encontramos una roca o una punta de proyectil o un anzuelo de hueso. Independiente que no está el cuerpo humano ahí, pero las ideas humanas están ahí. Por eso es lo delicado de todo esto, y sobre todo cuando estás en comunidades que todavía existen y tienen el sentido de pertenencia. The history being uncovered here is important not only to the Rapa Nui, but to all of us. It's as much a tale about survival as it is of collapse. Yeah. I think the Rapa Nui people have shown themselves, historically and prehistorically, to be highly adaptable. They do and have shown us, through the archaeological evidence, that they can change, that they changed. They changed their architecture, they changed their art. And their religion. At the other end of the island from the statue quarry is the spectacular Rano Kao. Perched on the cliffs between the crater's rim and the ocean is a Rongo village. Its low rock slab houses were built in the shape of traditional canoes. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, Orongo became the beating heart of a new religion, the Birdman cult. On the rocks around the village are 500 petroglyphs, carvings of the Birdman Tangata Manu and the creator god Maki Maki. The religion may have been used to channel bitter inter clan conflict into a much healthier competition for resources.
At the heart of the Birdman cult was an annual do or die race to determine which clan would hold power for the following year. The chiefs would choose their bravest warriors and they had to be pretty brave to scramble down the cliffs at the edge of the crater there, then swim across often treacherous waters to the islands and find the first egg of the sooty tern. If they could get that bird egg back in one piece, their chief was effectively king for a year. It's hard to find many cultures of this size that have created two versions, if you will, of religion, two ways of expressing their belief, two icons to represent their belief. I think that's what happened with the Muay. I think that's what happened at Orongo with the Birdman. That carving so fully articulated what, they, what the priests were saying, what people were believing, that Wow, let's carve that all over the place. <laughs> Which brings us back to the challenge of saving Rapa Nui's ageing rock stars. A chemical coating and water repellent is being trialled on the Moai being excavated by the Easter Island Statue Project. It's hoped the treatment will minimise the eroding effects of the elements. We're monitoring the ambient environment, the rainfall, the sun, the temperature, the wind direction, the wind velocity, all of these things, both around the statue and in the stone. And at the end of a five-year period, when we're, we complete our, our work in this, in this particular quarry, we'll, we'll be able to report what we know is, is attacking the statue. So what I was thinking, Christian, is what we have to come to grips with is how we're going to show each of these statues to people who've never seen them before. Dr Van Tilburg believes the best way to conserve the incredible skill and art of the ancient Rapa Nui may be to remove a handful of the statues from the landscape. I would add like um, some uh, black and white. Otherwise, their detail may be lost to all but Christian Pacarati's drawn records. Since the very beginning, they came in separate pages. Could a museum be built on the island within which five or six, perhaps, statues of the most importance could be taken and erected and protected? Yes, that's a real option. And that should, in my opinion, be considered. But they were found first at the Orongo, right? Christian agrees. But I think it's time to do something for them. They already have been made so many for us. Why not to do something for them? Uh, put them somewhere else um, under protection, like uh, under a dome or at the museum or in a chamber or whatever, do whatever. Maybe the best idea is to roof some of them in, right there in the field without moving them. Put something on top. But it's a controversial idea which has yet to win over powerful figures, such as Mario Tuki, a member of the Rapa Nui Parliament. Do we want to go visit them? But they are not excavating in this season. No. That debate about conservation will be fought for some time yet. For now, though, Moai number 156, fondly known as Papa, will be left in peace. The excavated soil is being returned to the pit because, at the moment, that's Papa's best protection. It's difficult because we've had, you know, taking that dirt out has been arduous and we've screened every inch of it, so 
seeing it go back in, hearing it go back in is really hard sometimes. <laughs> but I think it's, it's obviously the best thing to do, so we're, we're, we're okay with it. Joanne Van Tilburg and her team will be back in a few months to do it all again as they continue their dig to the bottom of the statue's six metre form. Such is archaeology and a particular obsession with saving the Moai. I think that the value of the statue as an art object, as an aesthetic expression, as an icon of religion, as a, a museum object even, in a way, um, is incalculable. I think it would be a failure, a tremendous failure, of us as scientists if we let this go.